the very last preparation that the pilots in spaceship do before release is they push that control stick all the way forward, ensuring that we have a perfect separation. We're 15 seconds. 10. Five, three, two, one, release, release, release. Ignition, good control. There's Mach 1. The pilots have started trimming for that turn towards space. Trim is now set. There is max Q. That's the point of maximum pressure exerted on the vehicle by the atmosphere. Those on board are experiencing about three Gs right now and traveling over a thousand miles an hour. That's incredible. I can imagine they're having quite a great time. We're at Mach 2. We're in the vertical headed towards space. This is the part where they're seeing Earth move away and seeing space come into view and seeing that they're going to space and just, it is an incredible feeling. The so we've got about Mach 2.8, Mach 3 approximately, and rocket motor cutoff. Amazing. The crowds here are just <laughs> absolutely going wild. I can't imagine what's happening in Antigua with them cheering them on. That's Incredible. Awesome. Go Keisha, go Anna, <laughs> go John. So everybody on board has been cleared to unstrap and enjoy that zero G experience. The pilots have unlocked the feather. That's the preparation so that they can raise the feather here momentarily. They're engaging the RCS as well. The feather is now starting to move on its way up. Everyone's up out of their seats. Just oh, it's incredible. They're the all, I know, they're, it's, in, it's amazing. They're all going to the window and taking in this just absolutely incredible view of Earth, the planet where all of their experiences are held. Everything they've ever known is That's wonderful. down below. The feather is all the way up. We have a predicted apogee of about 289,000 feet. That is amazing. Our crew looks like they're having an absolutely incredible time and they are officially astronauts. Welcome to space. Woo. Congratulations <laughs> to John, to Keisha, to Anna on becoming astronauts today. And a special congratulations to our Unity pilot, Kelly, for her first space flight. And welcome back to space, CJ and Beth. And the vehicle is oriented in that, that back flipper, that upside down maneuver from our perspective. Uh, and you can see them just enjoying that view of the Earth below. Oh, they, man, it's just incredible. I, I can see that they just can't take their eyes away. And it's, you know, it's hard for us to describe. We can obviously see they're having just an incredible time in space taking in the views, but it's an experience. It's the silence. It's the views. It's yes. seeing our brilliant planet against the matte black of space. I can't imagine I can't imagine what, I mean, I, could, I can't imagine what they're going through right now, and I can't wait to hear about it. Yeah, well, we just achieved our apogee at 290,000 feet. That's 88 and a half kilometers. Amazing. And apogee is actually a very unique part of our experience. It's when our vehicle begins that descent back down to Earth, and everything stands still. It's just, and we take a moment in the cabin, silent, and looking out as a crew, and it's, 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 an, it's, it's an experience I can only describe with these words, but one to be felt, really. Yes, so the pilots have initiated the uh, uh, motion to return the vehicle around, complete that backflip all the mm -hmm. way around, and orient us for the uh, re-entry. <clears throat> They've just made the return to seat call. They do that before we get to about 0.1 Gs. The pilots tell those, the passengers when to return to their seats, and then it's something that our training team has made very natural and intuitive, absolutely. even though yeah. you're in that reduced G environment. Yeah, absolutely. During the uh, days up leading to training, it's something that all of our crew practice. Our um, cabin is very purposefully designed yes. to allow for our crew to get back into their seats and even on re-entry, the, the amount of Gs that you feel, but um, mm -hmm. is, I mean, it's designed that anyone can do it, as we've and seen today, and the views are going to be amazing on the way down, too. So when we talk about 
space travel, right? With a, the boost, everybody recognizes that as, as exciting and thrilling, but the reentry is actually quite thrilling as well. And we have shock waves that uh, stand, form over the top of the, uh, of the vehicle. We're, right now, they're experiencing the max G on reentry of about 3.5. Um, we're supersonic, so if you're outside here at the Spaceport America, you should hear a double sonic boom as space, uh, Spaceship once again breaks the sound barrier on reentry. We're now, we just passed subsonic. Amazing. And the crowds, again, are just cheering on our entire crew. They're going to be able to see the vehicle um, as it comes down to land, and our crew here are also uh, going to be... Um, just again, they're going to be able to see Spaceport America. They're going to be able to see their, you know, see just see that their family and their friends are yes. there cheering them on as they come back and return to Spaceport America. So we've passed below 60,000 feet. Uh, once we get to about 53 to 55,000 feet, we'll command the feather down. That'll um, result in the nose of the spaceship dropping. And then once the feather is down and locked, it, which it's now moving, the crew will pull back on the stick and make a gentle return to. Uh, level flight. I remember during the re-entry, I just could not, again, I just could not stop looking <laughs> out the window. The, the landscape of New Mexico is just very indicative of this planet. It's beautiful and it's that, um, it's really just amplifies going to space, looking down on just the beautiful planet you've just left. And the feather is now down and locked. So the pilots are starting that uh, gentle pull back to straight and level flight. It's Spaceship is now a glider, so it's all about balancing that potential and kinetic energy. If they want to go faster, they push the nose uh, down, and if they want to go slower, they pull back and bring the nose up. It's absolutely incredible. G2 is a flight for the history books. The crew on board are on the leading edge of broadening space access and are taking the first steps in hopes that others may find it easier to follow their lead. Now, Keisha and Anna have become astronauts today thanks to Space for Humanity, whose mission is to expand access to space for, uh, for everyone. And to talk more about their mission and their purpose, we actually have a special guest in the studio, Space for Humanity's Executive Director, Rachel Lyons. Rachel. Welcome to the studio. Thank you so much for having me, Sarisha. It's such an honor to be here. Oh my gosh, you must just be absolutely pumped. So before we talk about Keisha and Anna, I know we all want to, I wanted to ask, could you tell us about Space for Humanity's mission? Absolutely, yeah, and I am so excited. The team is so excited. It's such a dream come true to see this happening, to see Keisha and Anna and John going to space. I'm, I'm like pinching myself here, watching this whole thing come to fruition. <laughs> And so Space for Humanity, we're a nonprofit organization founded by Dylan Taylor, who's a space investor and founder and CEO. And um, our mission, as you have been mentioning, is to sponsor people from all over the world to go to space. Yeah. When also, as you guys have both been mentioning, when people go to space and they look back down at our planet as this interconnected, fragile, beautiful, finite planet, it changes a person's perspective forever. Yeah. As you <laughs> spoke about so beautifully, yeah. yeah. And so we're really passionate about giving that perspective to as many people as possible yeah. by sending people who can be representatives for different areas and nations and places that haven't necessarily had exposure to this. Um, and then so they can come back down and, and be that for the people the people from their country, the people in their communities. Yeah, I mean, could you talk a little bit more about that? What impact do you see your citizen astronauts having, or what impact do you hope that they'll have upon return to Earth? Yeah, so we've sent two people to space so far. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're so grateful for this partnership with Virgin mm -hmm. Galactic to send Keisha to space, and then more soon that no announcements <laughs> yet, though. Yeah. Um, and so in terms of the the impact that we hope that they have, I would say that it's different depending on the person. And we can't predict what that is. Um, but what we're looking for is people who are committed to making a difference in their communities. People who have a track record of, of success. And people who have a track record of doing things that make a difference in the world. Yeah. Um, people who are natural leaders. And, and so the hope is, is that each of them come back down and make a difference in a way that's true for them. And, and like I said, we can't predict that. It's not prescriptive. And depending on the, the cares and the passions of the individual, it'll look different. Absolutely. And so that's the cool thing about Keisha and, and Anna going to space and just watching you know, the people that are impacted and, and the, their unique message mm -hmm. that Virgin Galactic has done such a beautiful job of capturing 
um, it's just amazing to watch. Yeah, I mean, actually, look, speaking of Keisha and Anna, yeah. you, I mean, you've seen their journey from when they were selected. You were there. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe you could talk about, you know, being there, Keisha's reaction to her journey, training for spaceflight, being here on site, and then you saw her go to space. What impact have you already seen that journey make? Yeah, so yeah, we were there just about two years ago, a little yeah. bit less than two years ago now. Um, myself, Richard Branson, some other Virgin Galactic team members and other people that were part of the campaign. And so I had the honor of going to Keisha's house and we knocked on her back door and we surprised her. And Richard Branson's face just, you know, greeting her when she opened the door. That's where we saw the screen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's she was on person. Exactly, exactly. And so, you know, that was, that was a dream come true because that was the first time we had ever given someone a, a ticket to space. And, and so to watch this now two years later, and also to watch the impact that she's having on Antigua. I mean, I've never been, I've been to a handful of space launches at this point, and I don't think I've ever met, even met someone from the Caribbean at one of these space launches. And so now there's reporters, there's people from Keisha's community, you know, there's people who are telling me what their flag means and what it means for them as a, as a nation to have Keisha be going to space, Keisha and Anna. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's incredible to watch and she is an inspiration. They are both inspirations for so many different demographics, so many different groups of people and they're, as I mentioned before, their messages are profound already and they haven't even seen the earth from space yet. Yeah, I mean, they represent such an incredible community. Of course, Antigua, Barbuda, Caribbean, mothers, <laughs> daughters, college, university students, women. It's the, the boundaries they're breaking is just absolutely mind blowing. And they're just the first, there's, there's gonna be many more. So exactly. I know you're eager to get back and cheer them on as they come into land, but anything you wanna say just to close out and you know, just tell us about your excitement for Akisha and Anna landing and being there to cheer them on. Yeah, no, I mean, I guess all I'll say is I've had the pleasure of spending some time with Keisha. After we surprised her, she and her husband gave me a tour of the island for a day afterwards. And for her, this is like the biggest dream of her life. And, and she gets to bring her daughter on that too. And so I think that's, that's what I will leave everyone with is just imagining what it would be like for someone who's dreamed of this forever to get to go and have this experience and be cheered on by her entire community. It's yeah, absolutely it's incredible. I know you're going to be right there when they get back to give them the biggest hug. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Can't wait. <laughs> Amazing. So speaking of cheer, uh, let's check back in in Antigua with Chewy. Trisha, I'm here with the Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, and we just witnessed something absolutely amazing. Prime Minister, what does this mean for Antigua and Barbuda? Well, it's the most significant event uh, for the people of Antigua and Barbuda and the Caribbean. Uh, this is certainly a major achievement, and an achievement that will help to inspire great ambitions of the Antigua and Barbuda people. We're very proud of the courage and certainly the resilience of Keisha and, um, and her daughter. And uh, we are just very happy. Thank you. As you can see, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Yeah. Yeah. So sorry. Mm. Uh, 20 minutes past. We're good. 20 seconds go fast. <laughs> All right, we got it. <laughs> Oh, amazing, amazing, amazing. The energy in Tiga is inc just incredible. I can feel the energy here at Spaceport is absolutely amazing um, as we welcome our crew back as they come in for landing. Now, let's take it over. JR, can you to give us an update on their progress back to Earth? Yeah, I sure can. We're at this point just under 12,000 feet. Um, Kelly was at the controls there for most of the glide. CJ has just uh, resumed control. Of the uh, of the flying the spaceship, so the uh, approach checks are um, uh, in work. They've they've uh, planned and managed their energy management uh, as you know as you do with a glider, and now hitting those waypoints as they come in uh, to runway three four here at Spaceport America. So 
that's south to north um, on the runway. For those non-pilots tuning in, those numbers represent the first two numbers on the magnetic heading of, the, of your compass. So 3-4 is 340 degrees. So we're doing a um, uh, turn to final right now, and that's a, uh, a left turn so that uh, CJ, the pilot, the commander in the ship, has a view of the runway. The landing gear is now down and locked. And we're about eight, uh, 7,500 feet. Amazing. Oops. Again, I've said this before many times, but the crew have this incredible view, not only of the New Mexican landscape, but of our spaceport facility, which is this incredible facility where they spent the last few days bonding with their crew and training with their crew. So of course, yeah. holds a special part in their, in their hearts and they get to see that view on their way down. So we're 1,000 feet above the runway. The runway here is about 4,500 feet or 500 feet. Pre-flare, that's pulling the nose up and uh, taking advantage of the ground effect. It's extra lift you get when you're close to the ground. We've crossed the threshold. That's the beginning of the runway. Beautiful. And touchdown of the main gear. Now CJ's gonna hold the nose gear up for a little bit that helps bleed off the uh, energy that the, the spaceship has uh, using the air drag associated with that. Now I started to lower the nose. And the nose gear is now down. So at a designated airspeed, the pilots have the option to apply the brakes or not. They can let the, uh, let the vehicle uh, roll to a stop. We have plenty enough runway here. They are applying the brakes uh, today, so. Um, we have 12,000 feet of runway here 12, at Spaceport America. 12,000 feet of runway <laughs> and 200 feet wide, so plenty of room. 